this hit go live so okay it says live i think we're live i mean Are this is live? what's so confusing is that it says live here on the on the on the um facebook it says preparing the video but i'm like 99 percent sure that, that we're live now so if you well live schmive we'll just screw around here and Oh yeah, I see it. We we are definitely live. So if you want, we to are. It. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't see it yet. Oh, I think there's maybe like a little uh, refresher. You can like refresh the page and see if it pops up. I'm I'm refreshing. Okay. Well. Oh, there it is. I see our I see our pretty little mugs. I see your I see the, uh, your lovely face. I'm there just gonna go. I'm just gonna say something here. Oh, Alex Join Fletcher says. Join us now. <laughs> Join us now. Here we go. And a smiley face and a heart and a smiley face. I always have to do three things. If That's I if thing. I put if I put any emoji, it has to okay, first of all, this is coin us new. Good gravy. I I I have my fingers are way too big for this. <laughs> I saw you, yeah, you you um you sent me three hearts yesterday when you replied back to mine. And I, I thought, always oh. send three. That's so good though. I don't know <laughs> if it's a if it's a I don't know if it's something that's like, you know, superstitious or something ridiculous like that, but. Well, don't did they I say do things thing? happen in three? Good things happen in three. Well, yeah. And celebrities die in three. And now that got broken because Christopher Plummer died today and that's four. Oh, no. Yeah. I didn't know that. That just sucks. It does. It, does. it truly does. All right, now let me just double check and see my page and see if it's on here. And here it is. Look at that. The I'm looking at my phone. Technology. I can see myself looking at my phone. How boring. It's like looking okay. at yourself in a mirror in a mirror and looking at yourself in a mirror in a mirror. I, I know it's terrible, <laughs> terrible. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Stephanie, for joining us here on Under the Hood. And it has been um, 10 years since we had the opportunity to work together. Yeah. And, uh, that's kind of amazing thinking back. I was watching uh, you and Sasha's video um, that y'all did together. Mm -hmm. And and it's just kind of amazing to look back on that time and and think about, I mean, the production itself, the fall staff that right. we did at Seattle Opera was so much fun working with Peter Cazares and such a interesting kind of, you know, spin on a, on a, on a you know, traditional production, but he-, he yeah certainly made his own. I remember we all got dressed and undressed on that stage together, which was, yeah, which was great. But it's, it's just weird how quickly time flies, right? I it's mean, 11 years, by the way. 11, 11 years. Sorry. You're right. Oh my God. It's 11 years. You're right. Because yeah. I remember um, I was, I, I had made my debut uh, as Germont and Traviata mm -hmm. earlier that same season. Yeah. And then somebody had pulled out. And so Spike came, Hey, Weston, would you, what do you what do you think about coming and singing forward for me i was like yeah absolutely i'd love to and i remember trying to cram all of that music into my head in time for our january february whatever it was uh, it was feb it was february but i know because my mother died now. remember my mother my mother died during the during the rehearsal period that's right that's right and and i had um and spate had hired i was talking about this with sasha that that Spate had hired Melissa Parks. Melissa Parks, that's Remember? right. Remember? Yeah, she came in Wonderful and did, Melissa. did the rehearsals while you were gone. That's right. She did the rehearsal. She had did a whole set of rehearsals and then she did the final dress and I did opening night. Right. God bless that woman. She was so she was just the loveliest person. She really was. I mean, oh. that cast was filled with some really lovely people. Mm -hmm. Peter Rose was so, it was so much fun. That fall. was Peter Rose's, that was his first fall staff. Yeah, yeah. It was a wonderful, and, and Ricardo Fritza was the first time I believe he ever conducted Falstaff. I'm certain of that because it was my first Ford and I was terrified, desperately looking for any kind of cue for that act two craziness when I come storming the castle. <laughs> and he, he was still sort of learning and I think, and I, I remember going, maestro, maestro, if, we, if you could please, he was like, yeah, of course, of course. You know, I just knew he, I was like, I know you're, you're, you're looking at it too. It's, it's a lot, but. I have to say the the thing that I I mean I remember a lot of things about that production, but one of the things that has always stuck with me was your support and your generosity and kindness. Just standing with you backstage before we all walked on for that Act Two thing, and you telling me, you know, whether it was like how great you thought I sounded in the aria before, or how, you know, I've got this. 
whatever it was that you told me, I just thought, if Stephanie thinks I can do it, I can do it. So oh, <laughs> I was so thankful for your support in that. Well, you know what? That is that, first of all, thank thank you for telling me that. It It is, you know, it's one of the most, one of the things that I love to tell young singers that I'm working on a show with especially a show like Fall Step that I've done so many times. I love the end of the la of the end of the first night. And I always say the same thing. You'll only do this for the first time once. That's very and true. And you got it over with and aren't you proud? It is it, that is a, a nerve-wracking opera. Yeah, it really can it's be. I mean, of course it became like one of my favorite operas ever. I oh, mean, yeah. it really to this day is still yeah. one of the favorite things I've ever done. Well, you sang the piss out of it. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank but you. it was a, it, but the thing that was I I I've done a lot of productions of Falstaff and I told Sasha the other day, so, you know, this that was my favorite production. Of all the all the productions I've ever done, that was my favorite one. With all due respect. Sure. To everybody else. That production told the story in a way that I'm that that you just don't always get. And my first Falstaff was Zeffirelli Falstaff. Oh wow. But this Falstaff, which was pretty bare bones, yeah, but really felt like an acting troupe doing Falstaff, who just happened to be all of those characters. Right. That's exactly what it was. I mean, I have never been in a show like that where you are doesn't matter who you are you are literally on stage the entire time yes if you're, yeah. if you're not in the scene you're watching the scene and right that's that sums it up so beautifully it's like it was a it was an acting troupe that was there to perform the show and we happened to be those characters yeah and that, was, that was the story that we told i mean it was so yeah. so well done in all the different sort of uh <laughs> i mean i don't know it was it, and you you mentioned like kind of bare bones i mean Mm -hmm. It's funny sometimes what producing organizations or schools or whatever think that you need to have in order to make an opera. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that set was all of what, like some steps and a little, you know, thing up top and then the main playing area. I mean, it was a deck. It, it was a, it was a round, it was a, a half moon deck. Right. Raised deck and a, and a, and a playing space. That's it. In the middle and boxes and, and chairs. Yeah, some chairs and a couple benches to sit on. Yeah, yeah, and and the, and we moved them. Remember, we we're, oh, yeah. we're, we created, you know, and the thing that that, uh, but the thing that was really lovely about it was that it was very funny it was. without without trying to be funny. It just let the piece do the talking. Yeah, and that's the problem that I find happens so frequently in in opera is that people are so worried about the piece that rather than just telling the story yeah they feel like they have to be an apologist uh-huh for the art form right and just let it let it be let the opera be what it is it is what it is let it be what it is and let people appreciate it for what it is and when you do that it always ha that's when you get people in the audience going oh I, I, I really love opera. But if you try to pretend that it's something it's not, you know, just right. let it be what it is. And, the, and, it, and, and we don't have to apologize for it. That's what right. we need to do is make sure that we are not some weird gatekeeper of art, keeping people out or saying only this is, this is an art form only for us. Right. That's the thing we have to, that's what we have to blow apart. I want to blow apart the cannon. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> I want to, I really, I, you know what, what's so, what's so disappointing, not disappointing, but what is so kind of makes me go, really, really is looking at some of the schedules that are coming up for, for places that are doing opera mm -hmm. and they're doing the same thing. Oh my God. That they've done year after year. And with, I mean, with all due respect to all of these wonderful pieces, yeah. to Rigoletto and Bohem and Turandot and all of these, with all due respect, for God's sake, we haven't had opera now, you know, full on right. for a year. Uh, yeah. And so 
I was sort of something we was going, hey, when we come back, it'll be different. And it's just, I don't say we don't have to do these pieces. I'm not saying I don't want to do these pieces ever again. Right. But can we not put them on the shelf for a little while so that we can long for some strange? Yeah. Long you know, for some strange. I like that. <laughs> let's just lo <laughs> I'm longing for some strange. Let's let's let some other stuff come up and make us miss Rigoletto. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't that be nice? That would be nice. I mean, you know, it's interesting. I think people, you know, again, it's apology or it's fear, you know, that people won't come. Um, in your experience, when you do something a little off the wall, avant-garde, you know, do people love it or hate it? I mean, um, in my experience, people are like, wow, this was so neat. This was so different. This was so yeah. exciting. A turn from the norm. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's good stuff. And I think you know, there are some companies out there that are planning some really interesting things. I agree. But but you're I I, I agree with you. But by and large, we're seeing Carmen. Yeah. And I love Carmen. Who does um, you know what I mean? I love it. But I don't, but you know, when we have a steady diet of the same thing again and again and again, it makes us no wonder we 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 all have to walk around going, come see opera, come see opera. What is it, Carmen? <laughs> I but I I know. Is there something else? Right. You know, and I love, I, I, and I don't, I adore this art form and I love these pieces. It's not that I don't love them. And it's not that I don't think that singers should learn how to sing them. And it's not that I don't want to ever sing them again, but we have to make some room to expand the canon. Agreed. Because yeah. they did. Of course. They did. Yeah, you you look back in time and you consider what was going on and then how that expanded i think it's been a significant drop off for quite some time since we've really done some work to to introduce new new works but also um things that just don't get done you know for whatever reason i remember when we were when i was at st louis a few years back and we did 27 for the first time mm -hmm. ricky and gordon's opera uh with royce fabric of uh of, about Gertrude Stein and Alice B. Toklas. Yeah. There were people who came to that show that went to all five performances, not just one or two people. A lot of people mm. came to see all the shows because it was compelling. It was wonderful storytelling. It was well sung. It was, it was well directed. The orchestra was fabulous. Everything, you know, I mean, that company just shows that company moves from strength to strength. Yeah. And they don't stick with same old, same old. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'm just an opera singer longing for some strange. That's, that is the title of my book. How's that? that I think that's a fantastic idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know, speaking of Royce Vavrick, I love that guy. He and Missy Mazzulli, when I was singing at the One Festival in Omaha, yeah. they did Proving Up. And, um, you know, it was such an incredible piece of theater where they created this like catwalk set where audience members were seated on either side and you mm -hmm. just watched it in a completely different way and i was just taken by it i mean i just yeah. i went to everything that i could um i was there to do medea but uh which was a very interesting <laughs> production what that ended up being like but uh james dara um ended up yeah. directing this and that and i mean it was again you know you can you can take pieces that are not i mean you know who does medea anymore but we certainly made it our own and created something that was bizarre, but this new thing of proving up, I mean, like I said, there are some companies out there that are doing some stuff that's like, wow, this is really interesting. Yeah, yeah, but, but I am, but you, but you, but you know, if you look at, if you, we can't look at it as artists, we can't look at it simply from the artistic standpoint. Right. I do understand where these companies are coming from. There's an enormous amount of overhead, sure. enormous. Sure. And they have to be sure that there are gonna be some butts in the seats. And so to take, take chances on spending the amount of money you have to spend, number one, to commission a piece, to cast it, to produce it, is an enormous, enormous uh, risk. risk. Yeah. And when you have a lot of people, when, you, when, you are, when there are a lot of people that are part of that risk, I understand why it's so difficult to take that leap. And so it makes sense that more grassroots companies do those kind of movements. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. And, and, you know, if those grassroots movements can be supported by, you know, Omaha Steaks, well, then so be it. That's, that's all. Awesome. There you go. <laughs> right. 
Well, you mentioned before that you you know the, the students have to learn how to sing this stuff. Let's talk about learning to sing. Where, how did you end up getting into music and getting into singing in the first place? I got into singing because my sophomore year of high school, no, my freshman year of high school, uh, the band director, Steve Robitz, came into our English class and said, we're doing a musical. And we're going to be doing Once Upon a Mattress. And this is what it, the piece is about. Uh, and I don't know why he came into the English class, but that's where he, that's where I heard this. Yeah. And uh, and he and he said, these are when the auditions are and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, you know, I wasn't in the chorus at the time. My father wouldn't let me be in the chorus. I, I played flute in the band. And so okay. dad insisted that I only I, I was he wanted me to be a flute player and didn't think much about singers. And so I wasn't allowed to be in the chorus. How long had you been playing flute? Since. Sixth grade. Oh, OK. And my dad played flute. So that's why my sister and I had to play. My sister was a clarinet player. Oh, okay. And um, and my dad was a tripler. He was, I mean, his main instrument was tenor sax. Mm. Um, but uh, tripler meaning he played flute, sax, and clarinet. Yeah. But anyway, so I went home and I asked my parents if I could be in the musical. And for some reason, they said yes. And that's when I started singing. I mean, I had sung in, 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 I had sung in, in my music class when I was in, uh, up until about fifth grade, I wasn't allowed to be in the chorus in junior high because I played in the band. Uh -huh. and, and not because of this, again, this, my father wouldn't let me be in the chorus. And so um, I, I was in the show and I was cast as Queen Agravain. Oh, wow. And so I had a part and I had a song. And I remember, I, I, oh, I don't know how many years back now it is though, but I did Carousel uh, with the New York Phil uh, a few years back. And Mary Rogers, who wrote Once Upon a Mattress was in the audience one day during the rehearsal. Wow. And I got to go up to her and tell her, you know, you're the reason that I started singing it was your That's show. So great. And she was uh, it, just incredibly charming. A very charming lady. But anyway, I, our chorus director said to me, um, you know, you should really be in the chorus. And he actually called my father and said, she needs to sing. And so dad let me join the chorus. And I started taking lessons because yeah, there were, you could take, you could take voice lessons. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a handful of us that took voice lessons. And at my school, we also had music theory and history. Oh, wow all taught by my, uh, by my course teacher, Martin Banner. And where, was um, where did you grow up? Monticello High School in, uh, in the Catskill Mountain region of New York. Oh, okay. And um, the heart of the Borscht Belt, that's where we were. The heart of the what? The Borscht Belt, honey, you wouldn't know any of that from, you wouldn't know it. The, that's what they refer to as the Catskills. Okay. Um, because it was, it, the, the, this area of New York was very well known for its summer resort hotels. Uh -huh. You know, you've seen Dirty Dancing. Of course. Just imagine that, but much bigger hotels. Okay. <laughs> anyway, my father played in all of those hotels. And um, so that's where, that's where I grew up. And we had a really great music program. So I was in the band, I was in the orchestra. I sang in the chorus. I did, we did a play every year. We did a musical every year. And so that's when I started singing and I took lessons. And the very first song I ever learned was V Melody and C Tesmia. Wow. Of Mr. Brahms. And this was your junior year? This was my this was my sophomore year of high school. Sophomore year. Okay. So my freshman year I was in the show. And then I just kept doing the shows. And I ended up um, auditioning to go to SUNY Potsdam to attend Crane School of Music. Yeah. Because my chorus teacher went to that school. So they encouraged you to follow in their footsteps and. Yeah. And yeah. I ended up studying with his voice teacher. Oh, wow. Eventually. I didn't start out that way, but eventually I did. But with Patricia Mislin. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and the rest is, I, 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 uh, I've told this story a few times, but for, you know, people who don't know my story, I went, I went to school to be a music teacher because my father wouldn't let me 
be a singer. I wasn't allowed to go to school as a singer. I oh, ended up becoming degree. a singer. Um, but my my initial degree is in English. I have a liberal arts degree. Oh wow! And then I went to I went to school and finished my music degree. So I was doing both. So I was doing them simultaneously. But the music school didn't realize I was no longer a music student. I entered as a music student, and then I got stoned for a semester and kind of disappeared. Yeah. And then I woke up again in English and kept taking courses in music. Yeah. And so when I finished my English degree, I, I was like, well, I want to sing. So Pat Mislin said, why don't you come back, finish your music degree, and I'll teach you. So I had one year to, I, all I needed was one year of, of, you know, like theory three and four and history three and four. And then I finished my music, my, my music degree. So I have two bachelors and I auditioned, I did two auditions. I auditioned uh, in Houston for the mm -hmm. Houston, uh, cop, uh, um, the Eleanor McCollum auditions. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I did the Met auditions and I placed third in Houston and I was a winner in New York and I went to New York. Wow. So I, I finished my undergraduate degree and six months later I was at the Met. Wow. That's very similar to, to most people I talk to. No. no. <laughs> it was very weird. Yeah, I imagine so. Very weird. Yeah. Well, so talk to me a little bit about some of the things that, um, I mean, if, if do you recall when you first started taking voice lessons, what what was the difference between that for you and just singing in the chorus or doing do, having done the role in the in the uh, musical once you started sort of having formal voice lessons were some were, do you remember there being some things that were uh, surprising to you or or new information that you thought oh i didn't realize you had to do this i think one I, what i learned initially studying with martin in, in high school was i learned the whole notion of of support mm -hmm. which was which was you know, a, a complete athema to me. I had no idea what that was. And, uh, you know, you just breathe. And so oh. I, that's really what I, what I started to, what I really started to learn. I was a natural singer. Mm -hmm. I had a natural voice and it was naturally loud and, uh, and present. And, um, and I was able to sing fairly well without any technique. Mm. And so I got through quite a bit doing that until I started really studying with Pat. Mm -hmm. And then she was like, well, there's a problem that you can't sing above a G. Uh-huh. And, and so we started, to, we started to work and do things like sing scales. And my, my, my teacher previous to that had a lot of wonderful plans and she, she gave me a great love of singing and she showed me a lot of wonderful repertoire. And but I was like a daughter to her. I, mm. you know, I, at one point I lived with her. I took care of her through a surgery. And this is an old story, man. Lots of singers have gone through this. No kidding. Where your voice teacher becomes like a member of your family. Yeah. Very not helpful. <laughs> very um, not helpful. Very not helpful. For some people, it's great. For some people, it works out great. Yeah. But in general, not a good idea. Yeah. Um, and so. Those lines get blurred quickly. Yeah. And finally, when I when I had to leave her and go and study with Pat, um, you know, I I I left her and I actually studied with Maggie Lattimore, mm. oh, um, wow. it, who was studying, who was studying with Pat. Maggie and I were at, at Potsdam at the same time. Okay. And Maggie started teaching me how to sing scales. I didn't know how to sing a scale. Wow. So she taught me how to do that. But I mean, come on. I meet a lot of young singers who don't know how to sing a scale. That's a scary thought. Well, yeah, you know, I've it I've happens. heard a lot of I've heard a lot of singers over the last fifteen years or so. No kidding. And but, but, uh, once I started studying with Pat, and I realized that you know that this that the most important thing that I learned from her was not to think of myself as one kind of singer. Which and is, which was how how were you thinking of yourself? I thought, I, I was like, well, I'm going to sing Verity. Uh -huh. I'm going to sing Verity. I have a big voice. I'm going to sing Verity. I'm a dramatic voice. Mm -hmm. No, you're not a dramatic voice. You have a voice, and the voice sings dramatic music. Just, you, you know what I mean? 
Yeah, uh, there's your Bach, your Bach recording that you put out is one of my favorite CDs. Oh, I still put thank that you. thing on. Thank you. I mean, it's unbelievably gorgeous. If anyone thank who's you. listening hasn't heard your CD for the of the Bach arias and and stuff, well, it, it's I thank you very much. But I mean, if you, I think every single singer needs to sing Bach, and every single singer needs to sing Handel. And one of the things that Pat taught me was that I needed to find flexibility in my voice and I was going to find it by singing music that moved. Absolutely. And um, and then later on, of course, I did sing 30, but the very first things I ever sang were Handel and Rossini. And did that come easy to you technically or did, or, or how, how, did, how did that try on for size? It, it, it didn't, it was, it was not easy. And there'll be plenty of people who say, well, she didn't really sing and she's no Rossini singer. No, I'm not. I am a singer who sang Rossini. Mm -hmm. I'm not a Rossini singer any more than I'm a Verdi singer or a Berlin singer mm -hmm. or, a, you know what I mean? Sure. Or, or a, a Harry Warren singer or a Puccini singer. I'm a singer who sings Puccini. And I, I don't, I, I think that it is, um, it's very, very difficult to avoid labeling yourself that was one of the things that I discovered. Yeah, It's very, very difficult to avoid lab labeling yourself because there are plenty of people out there who want to do it for you. <laughs> that is and so point. we label ourselves before other people get a chance to do it. Yeah. Because we want to be the ones to name it. Yeah. And I think in that respect, sometimes people make mistakes. You know, they're so eager to say, well, I'm that kind of singer. It makes me insane. When a young singer says, well, I've got a big voice. I'm a dramatic voice. <laughs> right. I've got a dramatic voice. I'm like, well, okay. <laughs> Just because you're loud, don't make you dramatic. That's true. This makes you loud. That's true. That's true. CJ Dioran just said, surely labels imply limits. You better believe it. Absolutely. That's you the work truth. yourself into a niche so strongly that you work yourself into a corner, right? And then Well, yeah, and the other thing I had to fight fight against was was typecasting because of size. Oh, sure. I'm still waiting for the call to come sing the one-handed man and frown on a shot and but no nobody <laughs> <laughs> I, I I like I like to use that one, but uh, but yeah, I mean it's true, you know. The 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 attempt to I don't know, put people where they think that people will want to see people, you know, whether that's in rep or in specific roles because of someone's size or whatever have you, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of, it's like, what is, what's happening? And like, like you said, it's like people tend to put, they want to put labels on, on you, you know, and I, I don't know, it's been, it's certainly been frustrating, a thing that I've, that I've dealt with throughout my career. Well, I think that the, you know, it doesn't come from an evil place. At all. Yeah, no. It comes from a place where we, it's become something different. And you mentioned this word in our conversation before we started. Yeah. It's become something different now and it's called branding. Yeah, yeah. It's the same thing. People are so all fired excited to have a brand. I need a brand. Brand is just another name for Fach. It's just another name for a pit, for 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 a, a box to be in. And I understand that branding has a very specific purpose, and it is the same purpose that Fach exists. It's so that people who don't understand something can compare it to something they know, mm -hmm. so that they can get to know the thing they don't know. That sounds a little convoluted, no, but I, it I, is. Do you understand what I mean? Oh yeah. If yeah. there, if if nobody knows who Stephanie Blythe is, right? She, Stephanie Blythe comes on the scene. Nobody knows who, knows who she is. Nobody knows what she sounds like. How do we sell her? Well, we could do a couple of things. We could put a picture up of her. Oh, she's fat. She's an opera singer. So you know she must sing mothers and maids. Or oh, she this this is this voice is the next yada yada yada. Mm. Oh, okay. So I know who she is. I know who she is, and, and if we're going to hire her, this is the kind of stuff we're going to put her in. Mm -hmm. And so in order to, I was really lucky, number one, because I had an agent who believed 
that I shouldn't be in a box. And number two, I had a voice teacher who believed, well, first of all, I had a voice teacher who believed I shouldn't be in a box. Right. And then I got, I got introduced to people like Spate Jenkins right. and Carol Crawford, Yeah, you know, and, uh, uh, I mean, <clears throat> at Susan Ashbaker and Bob Driver mm -hmm. in Philadelphia, uh, and the list goes on to 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 Peter Russell in, at Wolf Trap. Yeah, and I was introduced to people who said Peter Russell put me on as Ptolemyo and Julius Caesar. Wow, you know, so and now I'm 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 working with people like the, the you know the fabulous folks at. San Diego Opera are going to give me a chance to sing Johnny Skiki. I saw that. If you are, when you work with people who, who are not afraid to be creative, who are not afraid to be innovative, mm -hmm. you know, Spate wasn't afraid of that. He hired me to sing Carmen and said, I want your Carmen. Exactly. You know, so when you meet people like that, they, they give you the keys to the kingdom. And then it's on you to fulfill that. Of course. Then it's your responsibility. And if it doesn't work, it's on you. Exactly. It's not on anybody else. It's on you. Exactly. You know? Let's talk a little bit about the work that you did with Pat Mislin. You, you said okay. that uh, she said there was an issue why you couldn't sing above a G, right? Yeah. What, yeah. what do you think that you were doing prior to the work with her that didn't unlock that? And then how did she help you get into the top? She got, she helped me get into the top because she made me sing in the middle. Uh-huh. House. She so made me. She, she, she had me sing in the middle. I, everything that I, all the, all the scale work that I did, all the roles that I learned, especially the early, the the handle stuff that I, that I started working on, was all stuff that would, you know, go to the top, back to the middle, hit the bottom, back to the middle. Everything, really in that, in that center part of my voice, that, that, with the idea that the more, the stronger the middle of my voice was, the more it would extend. And it did. Mm -hmm. It just expanded. And um, and also the idea of 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 really, really spending a lot of very intimate time with scales and Marchese and Vakai and working, you know, working out all this stuff. A lot of the singers, the young singers I work I've worked with in the past. Uh, you know, I'll ask them, how much time do you spend working on scales? Well, I usually warm up about five or 10 minutes. <laughs> so, so singing scales is warming up for you. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. No, it's not. Singing scales is what you do after you warm up. Warming up is humming and buzzing. Sure. Singing scales is work. What type of scales do you enjoy working on today? And, and do you work with your students on? I work, you know, I, I don't have a, I don't have a studio. Ah. So I coach repertoire. Okay. Um, and occasionally I, I, I talk about technique when I'm when I'm working, but I try to be respectful of the of the work that they're doing with their teachers. Sure. Um, the way I sing now, the way I work my the way I sing scales now is not the way that I sang them when I was a kid. I'm 51 now, you mm -hmm. know, and I'm I'm in I'm singing with a menopausal voice. Mm -hmm. And so the weight the way, where my the weight of my voice has changed where it go where it sits happily has mm -hmm. changed significantly. Has so now I have this, I have a C below middle C now. So, you know, I, Johnny Skiki. So- I was just gonna so, say, thus Johnny Skiki. Yeah, thus Johnny Skiki. Thus Blithely Oratonio. Oratonio. <laughs> Which yes. we, I wanna talk about, but- But, but it so, is- but, but, but are the scales the same, just lower? I mean, do you, I mean, do you like to do- No, no, you know, I, I spend more time- Nine note scale? I or? spend more time singing from the, from the top down. Uh -huh. uh, than I used to. And I spend a lot more time thinking about the space than I did before. Thinking internal about, space? Uh, yeah, about the internal space. And I, and I, and to be honest with you, I'm, I'm, I'm studying with, with, uh, I'm studying with a new teacher. Mm -hmm. And so we're working out a lot of, of new things. That's amazing, though. I mean, it's so funny. I mean, of course, you know, the uh, I'm teaching now at UMKC Conservatory, and I had a question just yesterday. So, do you still have vocal coachings and lessons with your? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, anyone who says that they've got it all figured out and don't need to learn how to sing better anymore, you know, I, it's just like, you, they're missing the picture. You, we can always get better. We can always work on trying to sing better. And, right. You know, whether it's a completely new idea or a different exercise, it's going to unlock yeah. something and help develop yeah. something. It's a very, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating thing because, you know, hormones change the voice. They just do. And you have to learn. And, and I'm, you know, I'm learning, uh, I'm learning a lot of new technique, which is great. And, and to listen in a little different way, which is also great. Um, and, and it's exciting. It's exciting. And, 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 you know, for me, it's important that, I'm, I mean, I've continued to, to work with people and to, to study when I can and to coach when I can, because you just, you can't, you can't stop because the voice doesn't change. Uh, the voice doesn't, pardon me, the voice doesn't stop changing. Right. Ever, ever. Right. It, it, you know, a voice will change all the way through your life simply by, by virtue of the instrument, the body, right. but also where you are emotionally, oh. where you are intellectually, how, you know, what, what your environment is, how much time you have, where your focus is, your, your you know, I mean, I, there's so much that goes into affecting the voice yeah. And so that's why it's important to maintain that kind of that work and concentration. And it's a lot harder to do when you're working and you're teaching. Sure. Over this, over the last year, I've had more time to work on my voice, but also to um, kind of to, I, I've, I honestly have spent a lot of time writing music. Oh, wow. And and writing songs and spending a lot of time on my ukulele and I was learning. just gonna say the ukulele. I, you know, and I know that may sound silly to say I've been spending time on my ukulele, but you know, for me, it's it's a way of, of maintaining contact as a performer. Sure. Well, it's an artistic outlet, you know, it's a way to, yeah. to connect and and let me tell you, from this side, we love it. I love. Well, it. I'm very grateful. I, I'm I'm grateful for the feedback that I get, yeah. and it makes me, you know, it, it was it was so uh, it was so funny, not funny, kind of sad, <laughs> but you know, my uh, my dad, uh, before he passed away, a couple of years before he died, he he was in my house and he looked over at my uh, ukulele. I have a quite a collection of ukuleles and. He said, "Oh, is this where you do your little ukulele thing? Your, your little play your little ukulele mm-hmm. stuff." Yeah, yeah. And I was like, "Dude, seriously? There's when you make music, it's like the saying, there are no small roles." Exactly. I'm sorry, but if I sit and I sing and play the triangle, it's not cute. Exactly. It's my artistic outlet. That's right. You know what I mean? If I play I the kazoo, I'm going to do it with heart and meaning and feeling and tr- connectivity no matter what I do. And it's it's not my little ukulele thing. To me, it's not cute. To me, it's reaching out and touching people. And 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 that's why I got into this business for, in the first place. Right. And to me, it's it has just as much validity as as, uh, as singing Verdi. That's amazing. That's 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 beautiful. I mean, I think that for anyone who has had that type of connection to to performance and to connection between an audience and, a, and a, being on the stage and feeling that energy i mean sometimes it's trickier to do through a screen yeah uh but yeah it, it, it's not only an artistic outlet but it's it's that way of connecting to and sharing sharing your gifts sharing your your talent sharing you know yeah. your time but and and hopefully you know helping someone else in their day you know and that's the i think the the goal absolutely so you were talking about how you know, the voice changes depending on a number of different things. And you mentioned emotion and that got me thinking, you know, when you're, when you're on stage performing in a given moment of time, let's say on a page of music, how often are you thinking about technique based on, uh, or I should say, as opposed to your emotional context of the character that you're portraying in that moment? Do you, do you, do you think of it as like, 
I do the technical work beforehand. And once I walk out on that stage, it's all about committing to the character. Or do you check in, you know, from time to time, technically, while you're in a performance? I check in regularly. Yeah. Technically. Yeah. I do as well. Regularly. But... And I, and, and, but what I try to do is make it part of the performance. Mm hmm. So of I course, just, yeah. you know, you don't want to go blank. You don't want to go. Yeah. Uh. I just, I remember, you know, um, one of the last new roles uh, that I performed was Tom Crady, ah. which is four years ago now at Philadelphia Opera. And I was singing one of the big duets with Brenda Ray, who is just, my Lord, what a singer. And what an amazing human being. And, um, and we're in the middle of this duet and I'm thinking, okay, I got, you know, we're, we're doing this, we got to do this, we got to do this twice. There's a repeat here, got to do it twice. Don't blow it all out right now, you know? That's for me one of the hardest things about singing is that I get very excited. Yeah. Right? I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. I get really excited. And sometimes I, I kind of have to take a step back and go, okay, just be the person now for a little while. Just right. chill out, you know? And I, I mean, I fought that a lot in college and when I first started out singing and I had to stay away from a lot of repertoire because I simply, I got too excited when I sang it. Yeah, well, it makes me think of a quote from our, uh, our current uh, chair of the voice area at UNKC, Ray uh, uh, Feener. He says, uh, we want effortless power, not powerful effort. And I think that's so yeah. true. You know, it's like, it's very easy to get in some of these moments and start to allow that emotion to build oh, up. Oh man. And you know. We we had a we had a, a a conductor at Crane named Brock McElheron, who always said, "Heart on fire, brain on ice." Mm -hmm. Hmm. You know, I have never forgotten that. Heart on fire, brain on brain ice. on ice. That's a good way to do it. I remember my my former teacher at Indiana. He was like, "You have to remember, you're getting paid to make the audience feel something. If you yeah. start feeling that." It goes right to the throat, you know? Uh, man, I can't tell you how many times I've said that. It is absolutely the truth. And not only that, if we spend a load of time making ourselves emotional and, and turning ourselves on, you know, with our emotional masturbatory moments, the sure. audience doesn't see a thing. They don't experience it. All they go is, oh, they're really feeling something. Boy, what an emotional person. They seem to really enjoy this They're themselves. Really... <laughs> Man. It's so and true. We... It's, well, it's I, listen, so... but artists can be very self-indulgent people. Yes, they can. You know? Yes, they can. It's it, 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 it goes with the territory. It's very, very difficult to fight that sometimes. But fight it, we must. We must. So talk, I mean, I'm, I, I, I apologize for, for, uh, for getting back to, I mean, I love this discussion, but I, I'm taking little little bits that, that you've mentioned. You know, we talk about um, breathing. You said you were always a natural breathe. You know, I mean, obviously we all know how to breathe to live. Right. But, but learning how to breathe to sing is something a little bit different, you know? Yeah. And, and you kind of mentioned that your your initial teacher taught talked to you about support. Mm -hmm. how, how do you think of support? Are you, are you an in and up? Are you a down and out? How, what do you think about support and how does it relate to, to singing in the breath? It's changing. To be honest with you, my whole idea of breathing is, is it's, uh, it's, it's, in, it's in flux. Mm. I, I, to be on, I mean, here's how I learned how to it, do a supported breath. Here's yeah. how my teacher taught me initially to do a supported breath. He'd have us bend over and put our, the backs of our hands at the base of our spine Mm -hmm. behind and you. take yeah. a breath and feel the expansion in the back right throw out to the uh, big mac mcdonald's cup oh yes my mcdonald land my mcdonald land collectible glass oh, that's tonight amazing. tonight big mac is going away and the hamburglar is coming out so yes. i love very exciting I, I remember so vividly uh playing on the playground at mcdonald's and you'd get up into the big mac thing yep. and it was like a jail and <laughs> How we ever got in or out of those, I'll never know, because it was so tightly squeezed. I mean, it was yep. <laughs> and probably crazy. probably extremely dangerous as well. Oh, oh, I'm certain of it. You know, totally, completely. You know, no, nothing padded. They but obviously we, you know, threw caution to the wind, thinking about 
I wonder if any kids are afraid of clowns. Nah, who cares? Let's make a hey, listen. <laughs> totally. I broke I, I I broke my first tooth or the first tooth that I ever like seriously chipped was on a monkey bar. So, you know, it's that's childhood. Yeah. But that's how but that's it was for me it was all about the expansion in the lower back. That's incredible and, though because so oftentimes people are they start talking about just the just the front and they don't mention when you really drop and expand, it's not just the front, it's in the sides and in the back yeah. as well. And yeah. so for your for your first in, you know initial understanding of that to already include the lower back, I think that's fantastic. Yeah, it was very, you know, it was it was very, very helpful. But I have to say that, you know, singing really long scale patterns mm -hmm. and and learning how to, I mean, I, I remember <clears throat> the first time I started doing uh it was always a goal to sing three nine note scales in a row mm -hmm. on one breath. And I, I would always get to the last group of five and have no breath left. And Pat would say to me, Stephanie, when you get to that point, I want you to start counting. Don't take a breath. Just when you feel like you can't, you, you have no more breath, stop singing and start counting out loud. And I would always get to like nine or ten. <laughs> right. See, if you have the, the if you have the breath to sing to speak to ten, you have the breath to finish that phrase. Exactly. You know, but it was for me. It was it was about how I husband those resources and also where what my brain was thinking. Where was I thinking too? Right. Because I wasn't thinking point. about exactly. I wasn't thinking about the the this the pattern is a phrase and that really helped that really yeah. helped enormously yeah but the I, whole I always find it I, I think it's I, students are blown away that they can go that they can take in a huge breath mm -hmm. blow all of that air out and then sing a, a nine note scale yeah on what they think is no breath yeah you know it's always surprising and it's like yeah to your point mm-hmm you might feel that you're kind of running low, but that doesn't mean that you don't have the ability to keep singing, you know? That's it, exactly it. Exactly. Not but it's so, so many singers tend to overblow. They use too much air and it sort of, you know, it, it helps to, it helps to find that efficiency, you know, the gas. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of what, a, lo a lot of the work that I, that I, that I do when I'm, you know, when I'm singing, one of the things I like about sitting and singing American songbooks numbers with my ukulele is that it's not about volume at all. Sure. There are times where I, I will sing loudly or I'll belt, but for the most part, it's just very easy, uncomplicated singing. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that's one of the hardest things to do is to uncomplicate ourselves. I think that's basically... The, that's basically the, the struggle that we go through as singers is to learn how to uncomplicate it. My favorite quote in Lamperti's book, Vocal Wisdom, is the difficulty in learning to sing is finding its simplicity. Yeah, and that's, that's it. So true. It's so true. You know, you listen to recordings of like Leonard Warren singing Home, Home on the Range. Yeah. Or, you know, it, it's just incredible to hear what the human voice is able to do once those complexities have sort of simplified mm -hmm. to a place where you feel like, oh, I can just sing. And of well, course, everyone of, initially thinks, that feels like I'm not doing anything. Yeah, right. and that's one of the reasons that I love to have, I, I, you know, I have suggested to, to singers in the past, and I will continue to, is that when they're having difficulty doing a particular thing or feeling that simplicity or needing to get to the bare bones of something and they and they just can't do it mm -hmm. or or they're just having a hard time feeling phrases or the, or rubato that's a very mm -hmm. that's a very difficult subject yeah i will always ask them to sing shenandoah sure always i love that song and it's a great teaching song it's absolutely wonderful and it te it teaches so many it teaches so many wonderful skills, and it and it uses it in its in in its simplicity, it opens the door to things like rubato, to things like legato, to to understanding phrase lengths, to understand. I mean, 
singers have a very difficult time um, managing phrase lengths, especially when they're interpreting song. You mean um, like taking enough breath and making sure that they can. Yeah, learn, it, learning. Yeah, learning how learning how much breath you need at any given time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll never forget learning to sing Habanera with with Warren Jones, and Warren say, "You know, Stephanie, why you don't have enough breath for that that phrase that you you know that's a little bit longer is because you've taken a, a giant tank full of breath for the first phrase, and you have no room to expand for the second. Well, you end up stacking because yeah. You, if, if there's some left over, then you take another breath and then you take That's another. That's right. And, it, and, and you can't use it. Right. It's a waste. Right. It's a waste of energy. So, and then you end up having to blow everything out so that you, you can hit the reset button. And the minute we do that, with, it's all over. Right. right. It's all over. What do you think has been one of the most technically challenging roles that you've sung? Omneris was Omneris only because it's written for three different voices. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and I mean, really it's, it's seriously for three different voices. That was a, that was, but also the most satisfying thing I've ever sung. Wow. If there was, if there was one thing I can say of anything I've sung in my career that gave me the, that got me the most excited was the judgment scene. That's the most excited thing, exciting moment ever for me. And what was, and I, what was it about the, 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 or let's say when you first started working on it and you started singing up until the performance, perhaps, what, what were those technical challenges that you were like, huh, I gotta make sure I, what? The, the, the most difficult technical challenge was not getting overexcited. Mm -hmm because it's such an incredible emotional, it's an emotional blowout. It's a moment for, it's a moment for, for this character to show for the first time really who she is mm -hmm. at her very, at her core. And any kind of soliloquy scene is a killer. It's a killer. You know this from singing Ford. Sure. That aria is a killer. And it's not because it is the most difficult, uh, baritone aria on the planet, although it is quite difficult. It, um, it has its challenges, sure. Yeah, but it's because it's a soliloquy. It's because it's something that shows the internal dimension of the character. And generally when that happens, it's an explosion. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's a, and that's what, the, what this is. This woman who is completely destroyed, there is, she doesn't, she's at the end of her tether. She doesn't know what to do and she can't save the man she loves. Mm -hmm. And that is, it is just, it's devastating. And so, I mean, that was, uh, that was the hardest part of it for me. That you, that in all of that passion and worry and fear and, and horror, you had to find a place of stillness. And that's one of the hardest things to do when you're singing is to feel comfortable in that stillness. Yeah. Because if we do that, then we feel like we've lost control or we're not, we're, we're not gripping or holding onto something, then we're not in control. Right. And this kind of, of, of surrendering. Vulnerability. So that's, yeah, that is tough. Yeah. That's tough. Yeah. True story. And, and that just affects the technique. Everything affects technique, come on. Of course, of course. Everything. Of course. That's why it's so important to make sure that you understand these ingredients of technique. Yeah. And how to simplify them so that when you're in those types of moments, you have confidence and peace and calm, you're right? Absolutely. What did you Absolutely. say, head on, head on ice? <laughs> Heart on fire, brain on ice. That's brain, on, yeah. brain on ice, right, right, right. That's it. So, um, Oh, I, have, I also have to mention, you know, you said you were a singer who sang Rossini. I will never forget being an apprentice in Santa Fe when you sang um, Isabella in L'Italiano. Oh, that was so and much fun. I stood right next to you as a member of the chorus, you know, and you, you put your right hand on my shoulder and it, <laughs> I was just staring right at you going, God, this is amazing. 
<laughs> that was such a great that production was so wonderful oh yeah that's the and it's had a nice life up with the airplane that flew yeah. around the audience before yeah that was so cool it's had a nice life that production and i yeah. and i got to do it twice at, at santa fe and then again in seattle yeah and and both times with bill burden which was oh, such, yeah. which was yeah. so heavenly that's great and when you sing with somebody that you really love it just that's, it's gravy man <laughs> it really is i i, I mean you know most we we are fortunate that most people in the industry are good people. I mean, yeah. Um, and and but yeah, when you when you get that opportunity to sing with someone who you really love and that has it's been a long friend and it, it, you're right, you said gravy. It's gravy. It's gravy. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about Blythely Ortonio. I love Blythely Ort you say he was born in a basement in <laughs> a church basement. He was born in a church basement in an Episcopalian church in Philadelphia. Yeah, <laughs> he was. So good. I walked right into him. And I, I walked into him because my my director and my my mentor, John Jarbo, who was the director of the Bearded Ladies Cabaret in Philadelphia. Yeah. He we we were doing some improv exercises with um, Martha Graham Cracker, uh -huh. um, my partner in crime, who's just otherwise known as Dito Van Rygersburg, who is just a genius artist. And we were just, you know, John just said, our, our music director, Dan Kazabi started playing. And John said, walk into the room. I would like you to walk in the room with Stephanie. And then in about 15 steps, I'd like to see Blythely. And, you know, he just had me, he just had me find a different center of gravity. And we just found it. Wow. He said, you, you know, this man has has 15 pound balls. Let's let's see them. You know? <laughs> and I said, I take I take, you know, I take exception to that. My yeah. balls are at least 20 pounds, at each, least 20 pounds a piece each. And so, and so we had we had a really no, it was a it was a, a wonderful. Um, it changed my life. That work and this well, that, character changed that's been around. Life. That's been around for a while since. Yeah, well, uh, four years. I've oh, just four years. Four, okay. Just four years. Yeah, I, I actually started doing it just after I finished Tom Crady. But I, so here's what I love is that you're going to do improvisation acting exercises at a church <laughs> and you're freaking Stephanie Blythe. You know what I mean? Like, that's amazing. That's that is a that is a thing that every young singer should understand that, you know, there's no facet of this industry this the, whether it's singing or acting or you know whatever it might be and the techniques of all of those different things yeah we're always a student and we always need to learn oh yeah that's that's wonderful and i i john taught well john and my whole uh, this entire cohort of of artists at bearded ladies have just been unbelievable to me and of course this was all done under the auspices of of bearded ladies cabaret and and philadelphia opera Mm -hmm. And um, and the whole notion that this this guy, um, who's been in my psyche for a long time, this other, has he's been there since I was a kid, and I've al I've always really, um, just never had a I just never had an outlet for it, and now I do, and I love this character. I love this. I love this man. I think he's really great, and I enjoy spending time with him. I know that sounds really weird, and I'm sure it's. I'm sure that it's super fodder for a psychoanalyst, but um, there's something about the freedom of being able to play someone sure. that is you, but not you. Right. So is Blythe Ortonio the, the ski key? Uh, we or haven't that... discussed that. <laughs> I haven't talked, we haven't discussed it. First of all, I don't even know if he if he's interested in the carry you because you know he's a tenor. But oh, I've, I've decided... Okay. I've just, well, he's a dramatic tenor, but I've decided to start calling. He was originally, I think it was F. Paul Driscoll who called him a tender testosterone filled. I read that. A tender the testosterone. Tender. So I've decided to call him a tenderissimo. A tenderissimo. That's a brilliant new fach. So that's who he is. Blithely is a tenderissimo. And, Perfect. Um, and so it is it, it, it's it's wonderful because i get an opportunity to sing music that i've always dreamed of singing and and mashing up things like rock and roll and disco and opera which work really well together heck yeah they do
That's and, the other thing. Uh, people are so, people are like donors, whoever, are so surprised that we opera singers love rock and roll or disco or country or are whatever. Are you kidding? Please. Don't you find that? That somebody, wow, you listen to that? I, I, I've, I've found such surprise that when I, when I say like, oh yeah, I'm a big Van Halen fan, Journey, I love, uh, I grew up wanting to be a country singer. So George Strait and Garth Brooks. And Clint right. Moore. Sometimes people are like, really? Yeah. I assumed you just listened hey, to Hey, listen, that. one of the greatest opera singers I've ever heard was Roy Orbison. There you go. You know, I mean, can you voice. imagine Roy Orbison singing opera? I can. It would have been amazing. I yeah. think Meatloaf would have been a great cover to Dossi. There you go. I'm so I you know the, there I, I would love to see some of that crossover. Yeah, right. You know, we cross over into their world. Why don't they? We we need more. And I God, people are gonna have a heart attack me saying that. <laughs> but you know, hey man, it's all music. And if you and you, if you think it's not, I I I feel for you. Yeah. yeah. I feel for you. I I just it's it, you, it's very interesting. You know, yesterday I put this post on on um, Twitter. And it was the most likes I've gotten for any post I've done. And the post basically, I said, you know, who is with me that we stop using the word legitimate to describe the singing voice? And I'm sorry, I missed said, that. That's because amazing. personally, my voice is a real bastard. And and the and the 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 idea that some voices are better than other voices or more legitimate than other voices is just it's a point to me. Yeah, I mean, what are they even, what are they even referring to? Legitimate to what? Yeah, what exactly. Their impression Please. of what singing should be. Give me a break. Yeah, and I, I it makes I, I had just seen a couple of of posts on across the social media that had used this word, and it just makes me itch. Yeah, no kidding. Because it's you know for me people people ask me about singing rock and roll or in opera and, and American songbook and it's all style yeah. it's all style yes I utilize my chest voice a little bit more in some I utilize a little more mix in some yeah. a little more head in some but it's not it's all based in technique it's all based in style and uh, you know at this point. American songbook is like the most important thing to me. It just is. It's who I am. Yeah. So I, I, and I, and I think that more singers need to sing it. I think it, it puts, it puts you in contact with something that is very, very intimate and very real and very American, quite frankly. Yeah. I mean, it, there, it's interesting because we learned this, this um, technique that's been passed down from the greats right and mm -hmm. and we we so quickly get into italian art song and we so quickly learn french melody and german leader and it can very easily seem like oh this thing that i do is foreign and i have to work so hard to understand what it is i'm singing mm -hmm. about and then the english well i mean hopefully not always but i see i think i've seen it enough to see that the a lot of oftentimes the english repertoire that the students or teachers are giving their students even those are hard to connect to, but you're right. If it's like, wait, hold on for a second. You're, you're an American, you grew up in America. Wouldn't you connect to singing some of this American songbook repertoire? I think, I think you know, American, American songbook repertoire, which is, which is the birthplace of so much of our art song. Yeah. It's important that we know it historically, number one. Sure. Also, I think part of the other issue is, is that we have, we are, we, and I've said this many times, we are living in a golden age of art song composition in this country, a golden age. There is more great song being written right now in this country than in any other, than in any other time in history. And the problem is, is that we, the, that people who teach singing yeah. don't know a lot of that repertoire. And so it's important that we get it out there. And so I try to encourage my colleagues, you know, if you don't know Tom Chipulo, go and learn some Tom Chipulo. Mm -hmm. You know, go for heaven's sake, there's no excuse for us not to know, you know, Lori Laitman or John Musto. There's no excuse not to know Jake Hagee. Mm -hmm. There's no excuse. We have YouTube. Right. <laughs> You know, 
You want to know about it? You want to know about Missy Mosley? Look her up. Yeah. Just look, look up Ricky and Gordon. Look it up. You know, look, look up. You don't know Florence Price's music. I'm not talking about contemporary now, but sure. if you don't know who Florence Price is, go look her up. If you don't know who Margaret Bonds is, look her up. It's easy. And yeah. you know what? What's so interesting, Weston, is the computer does all the work for us. Isn't that true? Holy crap. Can you imagine? We had to look in a card catalog. I was just going to say, now, the Dewey Decimal right? System, card catalog. Had, yeah. If you wanted, you'd have to go and cross-reference everything yourself. Now, the computer does the whole thing for you. Yeah. Yesterday, I wanted to, I was really interested in, in um, getting some information about about um, Ward L. Gray, who was a, a really famous tenor uh, saxophone player. Okay. Marvelous, marvelous, marvelous player. I went onto YouTube. I listened to him for an hour, one piece after the next, one fabulous cut after another. I didn't have to do anything. So there's no excuse. I know. I know. There's no excuse. And I think that it is, there's a lot of really wonderful, wonderful programs out there that are putting this music out there. And I think gone are the days, thank God, that when you go to a recital program, you only hear English at the end in the encore. Right, right. I mean, there I are, so. yeah, well, there are, there are a, a handful of artists out there who've been doing this music for a good long time. But, you know, I'm tired of just hearing a, a, a smattering of French, a smattering of German, a smattering of Italian, and then at the end, something fun in English so people will laugh and feel good when they leave. And then, then I'll sing my arias. How many recitals of those have there been? Give me a break. I mean, that's oh, I, been well, but I mean, I think everything. Part, of, part of what is what is exciting is that there's a lot of innovation happening right now in art song. A yeah. lot. There's a lot of innovation happening in opera. And what's really great is, is you'll find almost every single time that there is an opera singer involved in the creation. There is a singer, not necessarily an opera singer, but there is a singer involved mm -hmm. in the creation, whether it's choosing a subject mm -hmm. or you know, choosing, choosing text or writing text. Artists are getting involved in the creation and that is a really exciting innovation. It's Absolutely. not, and it's not something that happened, you know, as often in the past. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I think that one of the things that I was, I, I was on the Maryland Horn Foundation roster for a number of years when that was still in its prime and we were mm -hmm. going around finding lots of recital opportunities for young singers. But when that disappeared, you know, unless you happen to be fortunate enough to have an entire recital planned by one of the producing organizations mm -hmm. it's really challenging to find those opportunities you know mm -hmm. and um i'm so hopeful that you know on the other side of this pandemic i mean when you think about it well you only need two people you need a pianist and an artist to, uh, to a singer you know to to make it make it happen yeah um, it seems like a no-brainer for how how we can we can come back in a way that um is very safe and yet entertaining and interesting absolutely and cost effective cost effective exactly you know yeah. i mean and there's and there are some really amazing wonderful places that you can go to find this music to create these programs and i, I remember one of my colleagues saying to me once years ago came to see a recital that i was doing for juan jones and afterwards he said I didn't realize that you could you could say something with a recital, hmm. and 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 to me that was a no brainer. I mean, I had learned almost everything I knew about singing from singing art song, and um, and the fact that I I you know during this particular this particular recital that we were doing was me saying something about my mother's death. Wow, and I. You know, I was so grateful to have that outlet. Yeah. But there are any number of places right now. I mean, we are at a, we're, I mean, we are at a, at a, at a crossroads in, in, in our industry that is terrifying and 
electrifying at the same time. And when you say there there's is a number so... of places, sorry to interrupt, when you say there's a number of places, do you mean resources or do you mean schools? Resources. Like what? what? What are some of the suggestions you might have? Well, I think that if you want to go, go, go on to, go on to, if you want to find some really interesting music, follow Daryl Taylor and go into the Art Song Alliance. Mm. You know, go, go and find, find, you know, we are, go and find some music that you never thought you would sing. Go yeah. and do do a deep dive into you know follow follow groups like Sparks and Wiry Cries, which is a Say fantastic Sparks group. And... Sparks and Wiry Cries. Okay. This fantastic, fantastic uh, um, art song presenter in New York, run by Martha Guth and and uh, um, oh for God's sake, my colleague Erica. I'm, my brains are are fried. Um, <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Uh, there are any there are any number of of really wonderful. I mean, I I've been trying to espouse this as much as possible. At Erica Switzer, um, Erica Switzer, I've been trying to espouse this as much as, as possible at Fall Island Vocal Arts Seminar, which is the 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 vocal art the uh, art song uh, foundation that I started up in Potsdam. And we had, you know, nine really successful seasons until COVID. Mm -hmm. Tough thing to do, to have a week long of intimate study with singers and pianists during COVID. Right. Um, but the, there is, there is a, there are a lot of. I'm, tr I'm just, I'm, I'm looking for. Um, yeah, go to the African American Art Song Alliance. I'm telling you, you're going to find more interesting people on that, on that site than you could possibly imagine. Really yeah. great people who are composing right now and writing music that matters right now. Yeah. And I tell this to I tell this this um, to young singers that I work with all the time. It's wonderful to see Schubert, and it's important. It's wonderful to sing Wolf and Foray and Du Parc. It's important. It's important to sing, you know, the 20, 26 Italian art songs that, sure. that you, you love to know. It's important to sing those. Yeah. But when there is music being written for you about subjects that matter to you right now, it's incredibly important to sing it. Agreed. Agreed. You know? So that's... Talk a little bit about, you're now the artistic director of the... I'm the artistic director of the graduate vocal arts program at Bard Conservatory. Bard Conservatory. Yeah, and I've been doing that since September of last year, uh, mm -hmm. the year before last. You could September find a, of 2019. a geographically uglier place to be. I'll tell you that. Oh man, Annandale and Hudson is so beautiful. I mean, the Hudson Valley is stunning. It is a it's a wonderful place to be, and I'm really fortunate because we have an incredible faculty of people like Erica, Kaya Iwama, Howard Watkins joined our, oh, wow. joined our faculty this right. year. Um, Lucy Fitzgibbon, a fantastic, amazing young soprano, amazing, mm. wonderful teacher. You know, we have, a, we have great voice teachers and we have, a, we have a program that's small, you know, it's a boutique program, mm -hmm. but it's great because it is, it is geared to the individual and people get a lot of individual attention. That's fantastic. And um, yeah, we've had a we've had a really uh, we're, we're like everybody else. We've had a struggle over the you know the last year has not been easy for anybody. But I can tell you that every single singer in our program has improved markedly um, in every possible way, and that's yeah. been that has been amazing. And we, we, and, you know, and we were really lucky because just before, just before everything shut down, basically, you know, almost a year ago, mm -hmm. we were able to do our opera. We were one of the only places our opera happened so early in, early in our, in our season that we were able to do our opera. And oh, wow. two days after we closed, everything closed. 
Yeah, I know at UMKC, this was before I got there, but uh, they were right in the midst of going into tech week for Albert Herring they were doing, uh, and then it, and then everything shut down. So they, they never had the opportunity to perform those roles, but um, that's amazing that you guys were able to finish. Well, we did a, we did a, a we did a piece of, of, um, of theater. We did, we did a, a, we did an opera that was a, that was, um, that they wrote. That the kids there wrote? Yeah. Wow. We did a pastiche that they constructed. So basically I, um, it was, it, a, a, it was devised theater. So I told them all that we, I, I told them they could choose five operas. So as a group, we all met yeah. and they chose Carmen, Bohem, Giovanni, uh, Ariadne of Noxus and <laughs> The Tenderland. Okay. And then I told them they could be any role regardless of gender or voice type. Yeah. And that they could sing any aria regardless of gender or voice type. Okay. And so we had we had a Musetta who was a soprano, marvelous Musetta. We had uh, we had a Harlequin. We had a wonderful composer, but we also had uh, I, I have a wonderful um, uh, contralto, low voiced mezzo, who wanted to be the commendatore. Oh wow! <laughs> but she great. sang, but she sang the Kitsimara. as um, the commendatore. As the commendatore. And we had a Rodolfo who sang, um, who 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 sang in, who sang from Giovanni. You know, so we had he sang or, or? Il mio, he sang our Rodolfo sang Il mio tesoro, and we had Mercedes who was a, who's a countertenor who sang the habanera, but started out as Mercedes and ended up being Carmen because Carmen decided she didn't want to be Carmen anymore, and she she went off with uh, Laurie from the Tenderland. <laughs> That's awesome. And Thank they were God it. that you're there. Thank God that you are you are helping to shape. I mean, but they you, did, oh. yeah. But you know, it was my idea to do this, but they did it. And well, and sure. it all and we worked on it with uh, we actually had a, a wonderful three-day workshop with John Jarbo the previous semester. And we did a lot of improvisation. They wrote all of the all of the dialogue that connected all of these texts. Yeah. I had this wonderful baritone who sang um, who sang Mitradi as Elvira. Wow. And um, we transposed it down a third. This was yeah. all with a full orchestra. And it was great. And oh, they wow. it was it was amazing. And what was great was that scene ended up being between Serlina. Yeah. And 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 um, uh, between Selena and um, oh for God's sake, Elvira. Don Elvira. Right. I had this. I had three meetings today. I'm, my brain is shot. Okay. Um, but anyway, and it was it was basically a moment for the two of them to work out their issues with men. Wow. Where Selena, you know, Elvira couldn't get over how angry she was, and Selena was saying, "You know what? I have to let this go." I have to live my life. I can't live in this. I can't live in anger. Right. It was so amazing. And they wrote all of this. They 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 made these characters. And it was really beautiful. And I what I told them was that the concept of the story was that they were all all 14 of these characters were at a funeral for opera. <laughs> and that's why all of them could be in the room. And they wow. all came they all came in at the beginning and they signed a registry, which you could see on the wall, you could see projected. Right. And that's how you knew who they were because they signed in. And they and the main piece of, of set was a coffin that we found on eBay. <laughs> it was this beautiful coffin and opera was, the, was in the coffin. Wow. And basically the idea that came out of all the improvisation and all the ideas that they had yeah. was that opera was dying to itself so that they could become self-determined characters. That's incredible. So Harlequin ran off with the composer. Sure, why not? You know, I mean, it was it was it was heaven. And at the very end, we went super kitsch and sang <laughs> and sang the Tenderland. 
Oh, the, like the, the yeah. tenderloin, the promise of living. You got it right. It was absolute heaven. And it was beautiful because this piece, like all art, existed and was revealed by the artist. And that was, it was really just, it was, a, it was an honor to be a part of it. Well, I know you're giving so much credit to those kids, which rightfully so, but my goodness, how fortunate they are to have you leading that. And, and I'm, I'm, believe me, I'm the fortunate one. I hear you. I'm I the fortunate you. one. And I know what you mean by that. I've experienced yeah. that similar, but that sounds absolutely brilliant. And I wish uh, Christopher Bradshaw says, that's amazing. Wish I had seen it. I, me too. I wish I, I wish <laughs> Christopher I Bradshaw it. is my oldest friend. We have known each other since the third grade. There you go. And well, Chris and I actually, Lively Ortonio may have been born in a basement of an Episcopal church in Philadelphia, uh -huh. but Rock and Roll Stephanie was born bef in homeroom before band with Chris Bradshaw on the piano. <laughs> That's awesome. That was where my inner Steve Perry came out. I hadn't quite reached Rick Springfield level at that moment. But Rick Springfield is 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 um, Blythe Ortonio's spirit spirit animal. Oh my God! I know Paul Groves thinks that he can do a Steve Perry, but I think that you could take him any day of the week. Ah, uh, it depends. It depends on I. On, it, listen, I did a Steve Perry number as an encore on my last show, and I was so cooked. What I did, did you not sing? Have it. Huh? What did you sing? On the show? Yeah. Or what? What? No, I did. I did. Um, uh, oh, actually. Yeah, no, not faithful. God, Open I did arms. a faith. I did. I did in a show as blithely. I did a mashup of the winner takes it all, and faithfully with Brenda Ray. Oh my God, that's incredible. Okay. Wow. That was incredible. She rocked it, and you know, she did a spot on Tori Amos impression in that show. Oh wow! Playing the piano. Oh wow. You never know. This is the stuff that I think that goes under the radar sometimes that people need to know. But you never know. My favorite mashup that we do is um, is Send In the Clowns and Vesti La Juba. <laughs> I, I want to see that. And it, it is good. It's good. It's well, Christopher good. says, I, I, and Annie Lennox. And, oh, yes. Yes, we can't forget Annie Lennox. Right. And also the Halloween I dressed up as Boy George. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's Those amazing. were the days. Those were the days. Come on. Those were the days. That's amazing. That's amazing. I sang separate ways more times than you could possibly imagine. Poor Chris had to play that. And then we have we have a, a really good friend who was a um, who's a he's a a guitarist now, rock and roll guitarist. But he was playing drums at the time, and we had a drum set. Whenever we had a drum set in the band room, he'd sit and play. Oh my God, it was. Boy, did we scream! Those were the days. Yeah. <gasps> oh, it's like living in fame. That's awesome. <laughs> you remember fame? Oh yeah, of course. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Remember, remember, remember. <laughs> well, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate you coming on and sharing your your stories with us, and and um, I think really, really shedding some light on. Well, maybe people did know this about you, but I, I, I certainly learned a few things, which I, which I absolutely adore. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's great to just see you and talk to you again. So, so the next time we're together, yeah, let's go do karaoke. Hell yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. We will absolutely. drink a shitload of beer. Yes. Eat pizza and wings, and, and do sing karaoke. Some journey. Come on, heaven. Evan. Thanks so much for having me on, Weston. I really Thank appreciate you, it. It's great to well, see you. I hope you have a great rest of your day and a great weekend. And, Thank uh, you. Keep on doing what you're doing, please. Hey, come and see me next weekend on Our Concerts Live for Our my Concerts. Valentine's Day concert. Our Concerts Live, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay. I am I am appearing with Blively Ortonio oh. in our home concert, our Valentine's Day concert. It's love that keeps us together. Be still my heart. Captain and Tennille, I, I grew up with that. I can't wait. I Honey, can't. do you know that Tony Tennille played for the Beach Boys? That she played keyboards and I'm sure I knew the, that. 
and was the only woman who ever sang with that band. She sang back up for them. Wow. And did you know that Tony Tilo wrote that song, Love Will Keep Us Together? I did know that. Yeah, I did know that. That's all I have to say. <laughs> I in my last in my last show that I did my I did a I did a show as Blythe or Tonio for Lincoln Center on 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 January 30th last year. Yeah. Last public concert I did before COVID. Yeah. And I got to sing my favorite Captain Tennille song ever, the B-side to Love Will Keep Us Together, Gentle Stranger. Oh, the wow. nicest song about a one night stand that's ever been written. <laughs> there you go. And I got to sing it as Blythe Yoritonio to myself. Yeah, it was heaven. Well, heaven. I, I can't wait to see what you're gonna what you're gonna do next weekend. Is this Friday or Saturday? When is it? This is this is uh, this is Saturday, Saturday, Saturday the thirteenth. Okay. Yeah. Well, and I I'll be debuting my new song. I just I I I wrote a love song, so can't wait. I'll be debuting my new song. All right. Thank you. All right. So much. And again, thanks so much, great, Weston. Have a great weekend. Thank you. And you. All Take right. care. Bye.